Um, not goodbye yet. Um, Romans chapter 6, is we're going to be continuing. Uh, and before we do that, if you, have a, uh, if you have a bulletin, you can pull out your bulletin. The, the verses that we're memorizing are on the back of there if you need some help. We don't have the, the screen up this morning, so we're just going to recite these passages, to, uh, this couple of verses together we've been memorizing, Romans 8, 12, and 13. Uh, so I invite you to recite these along. Uh, Romans 8, 12 to 13. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. But for <laughs> if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We're going to start off this morning a little bit differently. Uh, typically, we jump right in to the text. But uh, if you have uh, a bulletin, you notice there's a little tear-out connect card uh, and on the back of that, there's a space to write something. Well, we got one of those this last week from Sela, uh, who's a young lady uh, in our church. And she asked a, a question that, that I thought was really helpful, especially for if you're under the age of 10, you might have been thinking this. Like the thing that I've learned is if somebody asks a question, there's probably a bunch of other people that are thinking or thinking that same question, but haven't asked it yet. And so the question was this, why did God make us if, if we are going to die? I thought that was a really good question. Why did God make us if we were going to die? Because we've been talking about uh, how Paul, in Romans chapter 5, categorizes all of humanity in Adam or in Christ. And we've been talking about how death is a result of being in Adam. And so I thought this was just a great question. So we're going we're gonna to take just a second. I'm going to try to answer this for Selah. Um, if you think back to the garden when God created Adam and Eve, and if you think back to all of the animals that God created with Adam and Eve, the interesting thing is that he didn't create us for death. He created us to spend eternity with him and enjoy him. So in the garden, there was no death. There was only life and joy and peace and fellowship with God. And when he gave Adam a command to not eat from a certain fruit or from a certain tree, he warned Adam. He said, Adam, if you eat of this tree, you will die. So God not only created Adam and Eve to spend eternity with him and enjoy him, and to not experience death, but he warned them that there would be consequences if they did disobey. Now, if you're young, you've probably experienced this. Your parents might have said, um, do not go do that. If you do, you are going to get punished, or you are going to get in trouble. So God was treating Adam like a father who treats their children. So we can understand that. God warned Adam that, they, that he would die if he disobeyed. But Adam and Eve both decided that their way was better than God's way, and so they disobeyed God. And in Romans 5.12, Paul says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that is, just as sin came into the world through Adam, and death came into the world through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. So the reason that all people die is because Adam sinned first and foremost, and because we sin. And so why does God create people that he knows are going to die? Why do moms and dads continue to have children that they know are going to disobey? He did it because he provided a way for us to live with him forever as we were created to do. So in Romans 6 verse 5 it says, For if we have been united with him, if we've been united with Christ in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So the point is that God created us for life and our sin has caused death, but God has provided a way for that sin and that death to be overcome. He's provided a way for us to experience the life that we were created to experience, eternity with God and enjoyment of God forever through sending Jesus Christ. And so all of the power of death has been overcome through Jesus Christ. He restores us to our original intent. And so God made humanity to glorify him, to honor him. And in our rebellion, we have not done that, but he provided a way for us to do that again through Jesus Christ. So God created 
human beings, even though he knew that they were going to die, because it shows how great he is that he doesn't just leave everybody to die, but he creates a way for us to be reconciled to him and to enjoy life with him. If, if, you, need, if you want to follow up with that, you can come talk to me. We could talk about it, okay? Thank you for that question. I think that's a great question. So let me move on, and what we're going to do is we're going to talk about where we're going over the next couple of weeks. Um, this week, we're going to talk about uh, being united with Christ in a death like his. And by God's kind providence, next week is Easter. And so next week, we're going to talk about being united with Christ in his resurrection. And so this week is focused on death. Next week is focused on resurrection. And Paul has been making the argument that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are united with Adam by virtue of our birth. And that if we have been united with Christ, then we are dead to sin. And that is the basis for a new life. Like a lot of times we have this conversation about how do I change? How do I transform? Like I just don't feel like I'm that much different. Or some people they'll, they'll um, so I've started working out um, and I've ta- I was talking to the, to the owner of the gym and I was asking like what, what makes people come and, and join the gym? And they say, well, to be honest, <clears throat> they've just gotten fed up with the way things were and they decided to make a change. So to make some changes to, to improve their life, right? So Paul's point in all of this is you can't just make some, some tweaks in your life to improve your life, right? That sounds pretty depressing. I know, just stay with me. You're in Adam, and if you're in Adam by virtue of being a human being and being part of the lineage of Adam, then you are experiencing death and sin has reign over you. Sin controls you, but if you are united with Christ, then you have a righteousness that is not your own, that is credited to you, and you are no longer under the power and the control or the slavery to sin. So Paul deals with this objector that says, oh, I guess we can just continue to sin so that grace may abound. Right? If we're under grace, then let's just go ahead and have a field day with this. Let's go do whatever the heck we want. That way, grace covers it. Grace abounds all the more. We're good to go. And Paul's response is, no, how can you who are dead to sin continue to live in it? So in verse 1 through 7, which is where we're going to be today, he's expanding on that. So let's look at Romans 6, verses 3 to 4. Union with Christ in the new birth is the foundation for a changed life and relationship with sin. Union with Christ in the new birth is a foundation for a changed life and relationship with sin. Verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized onto, or into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the, God, of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. <clears throat> so here's the question. Is he talking about water baptism here? Is Paul talking about being dunked underwater? If he is talking about water baptism, then what he's saying in this text is that baptism is the means of receiving the benefits of Christ. In other words, baptism then is necessary for your salvation and a means by which the benefits of salvation are given to you. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. He goes on to say, we know that the old self has been crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So by union with Christ, we're not enslaved to sin. Does that union happen by physical water baptism? I don't think he's talking about water baptism here. I think he's talking about something that happens within us that's unseen that baptism represents. He's talking about the work of the Spirit in the life of the person bringing about regeneration and faith. So this text is not, Romans 6, 3 through 4, is not talking about water baptism. This is dry baptism. Yet, at the same time, for Paul, the idea of an unbaptized believer would have been absolutely foreign. So for Paul... 
he doesn't necessarily have to re remove the one from the other. Because the reality of inward change and being identified with Christ is expressed in water baptism. Let me try to illustrate this. Um, if, if you've, I think we're good here. How many of you have been to a wedding? Like, audience participation, raise your hand. Okay, so most of us. If you haven't, then talk to somebody that has. Okay, this should connect with you. Right? If, if you go to a wedding, some, some things happen, right? There's, there's this ring that is given by the husband and the wife to one another, correct? Right? There's the exchange of rings. Here's a question. Does this ring make me married? No. Right? I mean, simply putting a ring on my finger does not make me married. The ring is a symbol. It's a picture. It's an outward symbol or an outward picture that you're married. When you exchange the rings, you're participating in a visual picture of something inward that's happening when you're joined together in marriage, right? Or think about this. Uh, if you go outside of the country, you have to have a passport. Does the passport make you an American citizen? In other words, if you do not have a passport, are you not a citizen? Right? You're still a citizen, you just don't have a passport. But if you go outside of the U.S., you sure as heck better have that passport, right? That passport is what identifies you as an American. It's the it's paperwork that says that we're the United States of America is saying, yes, this person belongs to us. In the same way, baptism does not save. Physical water baptism does not save but it's a picture of an inward baptism that's happened by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the church saying, yes, you identify with us. Yes, you belong to us. It's the person saying, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you what has happened physically because you can't see it. It's happened internally. It's a person saying, I am identifying myself with Christ. And incidentally, this is why we don't baptize infants. Who do they belong to, Christ or Adam? Adam, unless they've professed faith in Christ and that inward work of the Holy Spirit has taken place. It's Romans 5, 12 to 21. So the invisible spiritual reality for Paul was so tied to the outward expression that Paul would not have separated them in his brain. Physical water baptism was proclaiming and demonstrating that one has been united with Christ and with his body, the church, through a physical expression of that. Also, being baptized with Christ results in something, the resurrection with Christ, verse 5, but we'll come back to that next week. So water baptism, then, is a visual representation of the activity of the Spirit which this text is talking about, showing that our identification with Christ in an outward expression um, and picturing the internal work of the Spirit. Because here's the deal. The Spirit has to bring about new birth. Being dunked underwater does not bring about new birth. Right? We're born first in Adam physically. We're born in Adam. We need to be born again in Christ, united with Christ by the work of the Spirit. That's John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. We, what's going on here? Where the Spirit blows or the wind blows wherever it will. We can't harness it. We can't control it. So it is with the Holy Spirit and the new birth. The Spirit just sovereignly works in people's lives and regenerates them and changes their hearts and brings about this internal change where they're united with Christ, they're baptized into Christ, they're identified with Christ, their life is tied to Christ's life, and then that becomes something that is physically pictured in water baptism. Born first in Adam, we have to be born again in Christ. So Paul says in verse 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? The word baptized means to immerse or to drown. To be baptized into Christ means to be totally immersed or identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's to be united with Christ. 
Our lives are hidden in Christ now. That means that when he died, he conquered sin's power. And because we have been united with him through the new birth, his victory is our victory. So do you see even now how this is starting to change the paradigm for how we view sin? So many of us think that we deal with sin on our own. And Paul is saying the reason that you can deal with sin in your life is because you are united with Christ. And he won the victory, and therefore you get to live in the blood-bought benefits of that. We don't fight Christ, or we don't fight sin on our own power. We fight sin by the grace of God supplied for us in Jesus Christ because we've been united with him. We don't defeat sin on our own. We look to Christ and his victory to defeat sin in our lives. So the result of this is when you're united with Christ, sin doesn't control us or have dominion over us. The reign of sin has been broken. Now this is massive. We need to wrap our heads around this. This is massive. We'll come back to this in just a minute, but just let that percolate, okay? Let let that marinate in your brain. That sin's power in your life, if you have been united with Christ, that power of sin has been broken. So another way to think about this is creation fall, redemption, consummation, right? So in creation, Adam and Eve were created and they were able to sin and they were able to not sin, right? That's how we were originally created. But then Adam sinned and all of us are in Adam and in our fallen state, that's changed. We're now able to sin and we're unable to not sin. So in Adam, fallen humanity can only sin. There's something in the most righteous, moral, good things that we do that needs the blood of Jesus Christ to sanctify it and cleanse it. And then when we're united with Christ as believers, we return to that state of Adam and Eve. We're now able to sin And we're able to not sin. So when we deal with sin in our lives, we do not deal with sin as somebody who is in Adam, who is enslaved to sin, who is under the power and control of sin, who is dominated by sin, who cannot help but doing sinful things all the time in thought, word, and deed. We now have a choice. We have a new nature. We have the power and victory of Christ and the grace of God and the blood of Christ applied to us. So we can sin or we cannot sin. But someday Christ will return and we will receive new bodies. And at that point, we will be unable to sin and able to not sin. In other words, there will be no more sin. There will not be temptation. There will not be a struggle There will be no unholiness, no unrighteousness. And so Paul is saying, when you have been baptized into Christ, your life was united with Christ, and his victory is your victory. Look at what he says. Verse 4, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Buried. How many of you have ever buried something that's not dead? Right? Like, your dog's sick. Like, let's just take it out in the back and we'll dig a hole. We'll put the dog, and the dog's yipping and start cu- No, you, you don't do that, right? We don't bury alive things. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. The finality of our death to sin 
is revealed in the fact that we were buried with Christ in his death. We really died with him. We really died with him. How did we die with him? Obviously, we didn't die physically with him. Our old self was crucified with Christ. Our old Adam-like self was crucified with Christ and buried. Incidentally, that's what baptism pictures, right? We get buried metaphorically in the water, placed completely under ground, so to speak. So then how do we how do we fight this sin? We didn't die physically. How does this provide any benefit to us? Look at verse 6 and 7. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died to sin has been set free from sin. So we didn't die physically with him, but we are joined with him in the benefits of, the death, of his death, among which are overcoming the power of sin. Christ's death accomplished things. They didn't accomplish the possibility of things. They actually accomplished things. And one of the things that the death of Christ accomplished was the crucifixion of the old self and the ability and power to fight sin and overcome the power of sin. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that through being united with Christ in his death or in a death like his, that you are dead to sin and sin has no power over you. Do you really believe that? Like, quasi-rhetorical question. Like, don't shout it out if you do or don't, but like, really, we need to think about this. How do we talk about sin in our lives as Christians? Just average person... For the most part, man, I just uh, did it again. I wish I could just stop doing this. Occasionally you hear a really dumb remark, the devil made me do it. I just wish the, the power of Jesus would overcome the power of this sin. Well, it did when he died. Do you believe that? If we really believe that, this transforms the way that we view sin. If we really believe that our old self was crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, it changes the way that we view sin. It changes the way that we view a Christian struggles. It changes the way we view temptation. Do you still believe that sin has power over you? In verse 11, he says, So then you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to consider yourself dead to sin? Let's get into some practical things here. Four things. Number one, Christ died to crucify the power of sin in the lives of those who are united with him. Verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Christ died to crucify the power of sin in the lives of all who have been united with him. So think back to what the context says. Paul's argument so far, you're in Adam or you're in Christ. Old man, new man. Old nature, new nature. And now what he's saying is if you've been united with Christ, the old nature, the Adam-like man, the old man has been crucified and killed with Jesus because you died with him. Your old nature has been done away with. Now, we still struggle with our flesh, right? But you do not have a sin nature. 
Your nature has been fundamentally changed in Jesus Christ. You struggle with sin, yes. Is it your nature to sin? No. Our old nature, our Adam-like nature, the one that was hostile to God has been killed. And we have a new nature. We are new creations. We are not what we once were. Right? So in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is united with Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. There's no like fancy Greek semantics going on there. He's not metaphorically speaking. He's saying literally when you are in Christ Jesus, when you have been united with Christ Jesus, your old self has died. You are not a slave to sin. Your old nature has been overcome and you have been given a new nature with a new spirit dwelling in you. This is the promise of the new covenant that had been promised all throughout the Old Testament. I will take out the heart of stone and I will replace it with the heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within them. I will write my laws on their hearts and I will cause them to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. I'm going to do something. I'm going to fundamentally change who these people are such that sin will not have power over them. So formerly, we were enslaved to sin, but since we have died with Christ, we have died to sin and sin does not rule over us. That means that you do have the power to say no. In Jesus Christ, you do have the ability to say no. You are not like the old person that cannot help but sin and will sin no matter what. You can fight sin. But do we always? It's like a It's a big left right there, right? I just think back on this last week and and the things that I've done in my life where I have given into the temptation of sin, where I have fallen into a sinful behavior, sinful thought. The sin doesn't have any power over me. I've, I've, I've died with Christ. I've been buried with him. The old nature has passed away. I've got a new nature. I'm a new creation. I'm a new person. So what do I do when I sin? We have an advocate when we do sin. His name is Jesus Christ. Listen to what 1 John 2 says. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. Okay, there's the power right there. John would not say, I am writing these things to you that you might not sin if you were a slave to sin. That makes no sense. Little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So when I feel my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. Christ holds us. Christ keeps us. Christ advocates for us. So even when we do fail, which we will, Christ is raised and is seated at the right hand of the Father who is interceding for us. He is our advocate. He is our defense counsel. And he stands there and he says, I paid for that. That is covered. My righteousness is applied. So not, he, so he not only crucified the power of sin in our lives as a controlling power. Okay. He also crucified crucified the power of sin in our lives as a condemning power. Christ not only crucified the power of sin in our lives as a controlling power, in other words, he not only broke us free from the slavery of sin and our chains and bondage in sin, but he also crucified the power of sin in our lives as a condemning power.
what can stand and condemn you on that last day if you are in Jesus Christ. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in, united with Christ Jesus. Not only the controlling power of sin, but the condemning power of sin has been dealt with. And in 1 John, he goes on to say, And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way that he walks. So for John, being united with Christ means that you're not only free from the power of sin, you're not only free from the condemnation of sin, but that you're actively pursuing Christ and walking like Christ and following Christ. Christ died to crucify the power of sin in our lives and in the lives of all who are united with him. Second thing that it means to be dead to sin is Christ died to provide us with the power in grace to wage war on sin. Verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. If you have died with Christ, you have been set free from sin, which means that you have the power to wage war on sin. We stand in the grace of God in Romans chapter 5. We have access to that grace in Romans chapter 5, and we stand in it, and that is the basis for our fight against sin. So many people try to wage war on sin in their own strength and their own power, totally ignoring the grace of God. Remember what I said last week? It's like we're saved by grace and we're kept by our own willpower. We're kept by our own religious stamina, religious effort. We're kept by our own moralistic behavior. When you were enslaved to sin, you were a victim of sin. And we have been given the power over sin such that sin is no longer our master. You look at verse 5. Uh, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. And you don't do this on your own. You do this by the grace of God and the power of the Spirit dwelling within you. For example, Romans eight twelve to 13. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, we will die. Okay, so if you've been set free from the power of sin, you will live differently. You will fight sin. And if you just continue to give in to the flesh, you are not truly united with Christ. And you will die. That's my summary of Romans 8.13. For if you live according or eight fourteen, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Well, crud, Paul, I don't want that to happen. What do I do? But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Did you catch that? What's the power by which we put sin to death? Is it our own moralistic willpower? Is it our own moralistic backbone? Or is it the power of God at work in us through the Holy Spirit that we access and tap into in order to fight sin? He continues in verse 14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you, do not, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but the, by, have received the spirit of adoption by which, uh, as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might be glorified with him. 
if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So Christ died to provide the power in grace to wage war on sin. Or, for example, John 12, 24, Truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls on the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So all, for all you agrarians out there, uh, if you have a seed and you throw the seed on the ground, what has to happen in order for something to sprout up? The seed has to die. And in that death comes life and, and fruit. And you have to die to your old self in Jesus Christ and have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And he produces fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, contentment, grace, uh, kindness, gentleness. Unless you've died to your own self, old self, the fruits of the Spirit don't show up. You have to go a couple of verses back and see the fruits of the flesh in Adam, in Christ. And notice what Christ follows up with. He says, like, like, unless, unless a seed dies, it doesn't bear any fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in the world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servants be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. What's he saying? He's saying you've got to die to yourself. You fight sin in the grace of God. Or Galatians 5.24, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. This is coming right after the fruits of the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. You, if, if you have died with Christ, if you have access to this grace, you are constantly crucifying your flesh with its passions and its desires. So what does it mean to be dead to sin? It means that Christ died to crucify the power of sin in our lives. If we're united with him, it means that Christ died to provide you with the power of his grace to wage war on sin. How do you do that? Well, the fight against the power of sin is a fight for faith. To consider yourself dead to sin means that we fight the power of sin by faith. Look at verse 6. We know that our old self has been crucified with him. We know that's faith language. That's trust language. That's confidence language. We know something. How do you know it? We trust it. We believe it. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this new life I now live, I live by faith. In Romans 1, 5, it says that, they were, that Paul was given grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. How do you fight sin with faith? Well, first, let's think about how you give in to sin. You give in to sin by trusting sin, right? Sin always promises something. Sin promises, if I just get out of this marriage, I'll be happy. Sin promises, if I just take a hit of that joint, all of my problems will disappear. Sin promises, if I just join the popular group and join them in mocking somebody else, I'll be accepted. Sin promises that looking at pornography will bring joy and pleasure. Sin makes promises to us every day. And we sin because we believe them. We believe those promises. We fall into those promises. So, sin always ends up being a liar, though. So look at Psalm 16, verses 10 and 11. 
For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you believe that? Do you truly believe that? Do you truly believe that in the presence of God there is fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore? Do you believe that your greatest joy, your greatest contentment, your greatest good is in God? When you believe that, it changes how you fight sin. Christ has died to redeem me. He has died to purchase me. He has died to put the power of sin away. And I'm now free to pursue superior joy in the promises of God because I see the promises of sin for what they are, and that is lies. At its core, the fight against sin is a fight for joy in God. And the victory has been already won by Christ. Let me ask you this. Does sin live up to its promises? Does sin deliver the the happiness or the peace or the joy that it promises? Does it promise fullness of joy? Does it promise pleasures forevermore? You fight sin by faith in the superior promises of God, the superior promises of joy and peace and contentment and acceptance. But you have to believe these promises in order to fight with them. Do you believe the promises of God? When you believe that, when you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, when your eyes are open to the glory of Christ, when you trust in the tremendous promises that he has given us, when we see Christ as glorious, our faith in those promises allows us to fight temptation and sin with superior joy. And if you struggle with weak faith, the degree to which your faith grows is in proportion to the object of your faith. You need a bigger view of God. You don't need a bigger view of yourself. You need to open this word and you need to see a glorious, amazing, powerful God. You need to see a sovereign, glorious, loving Father. So many people open the Bibles looking for themselves. Why do you think you have weak faith? Why do you have small faith? Because you're looking for yourself in a book that reveals God. When you have a bigger view of God, when you see more of who God is, when you see more of his glory and his majesty and his grace and his kindness and his mercy and his forgiveness, your faith will grow. That's why everything is about Christ and the gospel. Because when we hear it, the Holy Spirit shows us more of Christ. So let me give you a brief illustration of this, Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. This is what this looks like, I think, to fight sin with faith in the superior promises of God. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God. Now stop right there. Moses gave up the wealth of Egypt, the prestige of being a part of Pharaoh's family, the power that comes with that, the money, the cushy life, the ability to be in charge and make decisions and have food all the time. And he went out into the wilderness with this group of complaining, rotten, whining people who more than one time tried to rebel against him to go back to Egypt, the place from which they were delivered, who just bellyached and moaned and complained and groaned and griped for 40 years in the wilderness. Now, you think at some point in that 40 years, Moses wasn't like, ah, man, gold-plated chariot wouldn't seem too bad right now. What caused Moses to choose a gripey, whiny, complainy people over riches and wealth and power and prestige. 
at verse 25, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater than the wealth or greater wealth than the treasure of Egypt. Fleeting pleasures of sin. Do we see the pleasure that sin brings brings as fleeting? Now, think back to Psalm 1611. Is that fleeting? In your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Is that fleeting? By faith, Moses was able to see sin for what it was and count reproach from a whiny group of people as gain for Christ. C.S. Lewis said this, it seemed that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on, a making, on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. Do you count being mocked at school for your beliefs gain in Christ compared to the fleeting pleasure of being accepted for a moment by your so-called friends? Finally, considering yourself dead to sin means that you are alive to God. Verse 11, you are dead to sin, so you must, you must consider yourselves dead to sin And if you're dead to sin, then what are you alive to? Alive to God. What does that mean? It means that we have been reconciled in a new relationship with God, and it means that we're able to enjoy God. (laughs) To be dead to sin is to be alive to joy in God. So the desire for self-gratification from the world is replaced by a craving for joy in God. Sin seeks to destroy true joy and replace it with temporary pleasure. And what Christ's death and resurrection on your behalf purchased for you is reconciliation with God, right relationship with God, and joy in God. Sin's power is broken both in its ultimate effect, that is our separation from God, and its immediate in our appeal, our temporary gratification and pleasure because we have experienced superior joy in God. We have new heart with new affections. We have a new relationship with God and that leads to, okay, hear me. If you haven't been listening, listen now. We have a new heart and new affections and new pleasures in God and that leads to different living. Don't mix that up. If you think that different living will lead to greater joy and contentment and pleasure in God, you've lost Christianity. So what Christianity says is we have a new nature, we are new creations. The new creation longs for God, loves God. The lust for sin has been replaced by a desire for Christ. Our appeal of the world has been replaced by Christ as our treasure. And then we pursue that and that causes us to live differently. The heart leads with actions. Because the affections have been changed. Because the desires have been changed. Because what we value has changed. We're a new creation with new affections, new delights. I've never, I've never seen anyone sin out of duty. I've, I've never heard of anybody that, that said, eh, I really don't want to sin, but I should, so I will. We sin because we love it. Because the Adam like person craves sin. And when we've been reconciled to God, we have a new nature with new hearts and new affections that are designed to crave God. 
And therefore, our new life lived out by faith is a life lived in pursuit of God, which leads to changed affections or, or changed actions. You see how that works? You see how, like, it goes against behavior modification? It goes against moralistic living? You sever the root of sin with superior joy in God. It's like children that want to be with their dad. They want to please their dad. They want to enjoy fellowship with dad. They want to show everyone how great their dad is. Right? That, that game on the playground, my dad could beat up your dad. So our lives lived are lived so that Christ would be magnified and God would be glorified. So let me close with this, just give you a quick illustration of what I mean. Let's say that you struggle with covetousness, love of money. How do you kill that with superior joy in God? Money makes you feel secure. Money makes you feel powerful. Money makes you feel safe. Money makes you feel happy. Look at Hebrews 13, 5 to 6. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Okay, so keep your life free from the love of money. All right, how? Be content with what you have. How? For he has said, God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Do you follow that? What is the basis for killing the sin of love of money? It's the superior promise that the creator of the universe has said to us, you are mine, I am yours, I will not leave you, I will not forsake you, I will take care of you, I will meet every need that you have. That's being alive to God. That's the blood-bought promise that united us, or for those united with Christ. So you hear God say, I will never leave you or forsake you, and that leads this person to say, the Lord is my helper. What can I fear? What can man do to me? He's fighting the sin of love, of money, with superior joy in God and trusting in the promises of God. Do we live that way? Do you consider yourself dead to sin? Or do you wallow in self-pity thinking that you're still under the slavery and power of sin? And if you are, that's evidence that you're not in Christ. I'm not saying you're going to live perfectly, okay? Don't hear me say that. I'm saying that the pattern of living in your life will be one of pursuit of God. I'm saying the pattern in your life will be one of being able to overcome sin by God's grace through faith in Christ will be one of having a new affection for God and desire for God. If you don't want God, if you don't love God, if you don't love the honoring God, are you really his? And if you're his, if you have that, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. It's what Christ purchased for us on the cross. And we've been united within it in a death like his. Our old selves have been put to death. So consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Let's pray. Father, I ask now that you would help us as we think about what you've accomplished for us, as we think about the struggles that we face with sin, with temptation, with the flesh. Father, we know that we cannot do this on our own power, that apart from Jesus Christ, we would choose sin every time. And Father, we just thank you that we've been united with Christ and that through Christ, 
the victory has been won, that we are able to fight sin, and we're able to fight it not just with route obedience, not just with moralistic stamina, but we're able to fight sin with joy, superior joy that you provide in Jesus Christ for us, superior promises that always deliver because you are a faithful God and a superior relationship that comes from being reconciled to you and delighting in you above all else. Help us to see that. Help us to live that. By your grace.